All right, so we're just starting at the back. Uh, if anyone wants to ask a question to anyone, sir. How does the um, process work once the money goes from the insurance company to the bank and you're starting with your rebuild? Um, assuming that there's no mortgage involved, or if there is, or a top up, etc. So if it's a straight payout, um, generally, if you, um, again it comes down to your contracts, but again, recommending stage payments, as we've talked about before, it's very easy to uh, get to a stage payment. So um, uh, when when the slabs goes down, the builder will generally invoice you that day or the day after. And then it's a matter of um, you being able to withdraw that money down and out into the builder's account. Is that? Can I also say, uh, it's, until tonight, we've had uh, uh, Mark Rackley Gale here from the BNZ, who is uh, from the Business Hub um, with banking information. Uh, he couldn't make it here this evening the first time. He has left his business cards here in a box on the table. So if you do want to ask more questions about banking and how it works with the banks and mortgage and things, can you please take that business card and give him a call because that business hub, doesn't matter what bank you belong to, they will help you out and talk to you with information that you require. All right, so thank you. This, this side? No? No? Just coming forward. A question there? Yes, sir. Is it actually illegal what the insurance company is doing by forcing us to case settle? Because we've signed with a builder already and we've got a concept plan and now they've left us in the lurch. This is ridiculous. Um, this is not a simple question, but the starting point is the insurance policy, and most insurance policies allow the insurer the choice of either settling a claim by paying cash or by doing the building work. However, once an insurer has made an election to go down one route or the other, then insurance law says that they are bound to stick to that election. There are other uh, rules of law as well which would require an insurer to honour that original commitment or decision once that has been made. Um, perhaps Terry has a comment to make. Under the insurance contract, um, the insurer, there, there is a, a clause that says the insurer will pay and that um, in the past uh, the insurers haven't necessarily done the paying as much as they've done the rebuilding themselves. But uh, now that we're getting to the business end of the, um, the recovery, um, insurers with the pressure from reinsurers are saying we need to um, pick the pace up, um, get over the, um, you know, the humps that we've been working our way through. Now, um, some of them have decided that they will cash settle and they are uh, imposing cash settlement um, in a negotiated way. So if you feel that you um, don't definitely don't want or can't manage a, a, um, a cash settlement, then you just need to talk to your insurer about that. Some insurers have actually, uh, are starting to close down their um, PMOs, so they um, will not be as receptive as others. Other insurers um, are happy to take it one way or the other. So it, re it really is entirely up to your relationship with your insurer and the negotiation stance you take with them. All right, can I thank you for that question because it's come up a few times. Uh, it's certainly a question which many people have a fair amount of frustration about. Um, can I ask you to also go back and have a look at the cash settlement seminars that were videoed and have a good look at those and see some of the information and obviously, you know, take heed and listen to some of the free services and free advice that you can get, legal advice and technical advice uh, before you do anything. Okay, thank you. So next row. Um, yeah, Alistair, you mentioned about um, fixed price contracts, um, if you're going with a builder or a building company. Is it typical also to look at fixed term contracts? I mean, I, I often, I'm assuming most of the time it's a project management issue, but I often see building sites where nothing's ever happening. 
and you see a, it's not necessarily the builder's fault, it's project management or who knows, but you see a slab sitting there for a month, month and a half, sometimes it, maybe it's curing or whatever, but very little activity and, and given how far temporary accommodation actually goes these days, I mean, nine months to build a house and I, I know there's, there's a lot of dead time waiting for the next thing to happen and the framing gets done and is waiting for the next person to come to the next bit. Can, like for building companies, for example, can you say, look, you know, I want it done by a certain date. If it goes beyond that date, there were penalties. I mean, maybe it's a, a law question as well. Um, yeah, um, the changes to the Building Act sort of changed that a wee bit. Uh, previously, builders didn't have to nominate the completion date. They do now in the contract that you're signing. So, and they also have an obligation if there's going to be delays to that contract to notify you in advance. So the government's taken steps to change that through legislation. So. All building contracts now must have a completion date stated. It's not to say that the builder will put on an inflated date, which can obviously happen. Uh, but also, just be clear, you know, the nine months that I talked about too includes the design consent and process period too. So your standard build should be somewhere between 18 and 22 weeks. Um, yeah, but the, the, you know, you, you can get delays that are outside the builder's control as well. But he should be uh, again key to the relationship is good communication. So he should be telling you what's happening. Okay, so having some sort of understanding in a, in a, in a contract of how that works and what happens if if this is you know I know there's certain things outside out, outside the control. It's just trying to understand well you know what happens if this and. Yeah, well, in some circumstances, a lot of builders steer clear of them. Uh, these things called liquidated damages, which you know you won't get a housing building company to sign up to those. Which is, it's like a penalty clause for being late. Okay, you can ask for that to be included in, but both parties have to agree to it. So again, it depends on what the um, and again, the level of penalty um, is uh, really, uh, uh, you know, liquidated damages normally apply to commercial situations because there's really not really a loss but if you're in rented accommodation then you, it could be argued. Well news update, news flash on that because there are building companies that are going to contract with special conditions with liquidated damages in them. We know that that is a main concern for people. 18 to 22 weeks might happen at Rolleston with a good wind behind you and we are trying to get the building times down. But we, uh, we, as one group building company, do go to, are prepared to go to contract with a time, which might be, for example, 25 weeks after the slab is down, something like that. And we are prepared to put a penalty in there because we know how important that is for you uh, with mortgages and rent, plus the fact that often you've got life changing decisions happening around that whole reoccupation. So yes, we will go for a penalty clause and a fixed time contract. <laughs> the, other, <coughs> the other point to that is that if a building project runs over time, then, and it is the fault of a builder, then a homeowner might be entitled to be paid compensation for increased costs, such as increased accommodation costs under the Consumer Guarantees Act. And those sorts of matters can also be taken as a complaint to the Disputes Tribunal in appropriate circumstances. But initially, it's a matter for negotiation between the homeowner and the builder. And at RAS, we have had some of those cases and achieved successful outcomes for our clients. Thank you. Where, sir? Yeah, hi. Um, not sure where to start here. Uh, I've got a house that, uh, you know, the insurers originally said it was a write-off. And then two years I waited with EQC saying they'll fix it. And then the insurers said that they will fix it. And now I'm still waiting to find out what's happening with the property. Um, and, and it was supposed to be a, a repair. And now the insurers are saying it's, it's going to be a cash settlement. I don't know how much the repairs are going to cost. So how do I find out the cost of the repairs? How do I know that if the offer from the insurers are even to what it's actually going to cost? And is it going to be a repair or is it going to be a rebuild? This is a very good question and it has general application. You should not be settling a cash settlement with your insurer unless you are satisfied 
that the statement of work covers all the work that is believed to be required on the house. And I have worded that very carefully because it's not just what you think needs doing to the house, it's what other experts think needs doing to the house. Don't rely on your own ability to identify it. Make sure you have an independent view. You're talking about large sums of money here. The second thing is that with the statement of work, there should be a clear justification for what is in the statement of works. So if the statement of work says this foundation can be repaired, it should say why it is being repaired as well as how it will be repaired. Because you have to make a logical decision when you want to take the cash settlement and you can't make that decision unless you have that information. In most cases, the insurer already has that information and so you need to press the insurer to get that information. Just um, In that situation, the, if the insurer has the information, then they should be more forthcoming with the information. If they're not, then perhaps you may need to access assistance to obtain that information and assistance can either be by contacting one of the support agencies, for example, an earthquake support coordinator, um, or else if you feel like you need legal assistance from a solicitor coming into the residential advisory service and we can certainly obtain that information pretty quickly without too much fuss. When you um have a cash settlement you uh, with your insurer, you're required to sign a full and final settlement uh, agreement with them. You do not have to sign that unless you have, unless you're satisfied that that covers all your costs. If it covers all your costs and if you're satisfied with that, then um, you can sign that. Some insurers allow um, a partial build, so they'll build the foundation and then cash settle the rest of the building. Um, that may be an option for some people who have got a lot of uncertainty around um, uh, the, the foundations and they're with the right insurer. So there's no single industry um, guideline, I guess, for cash settlements. Um, all the insurers do it slightly differently. Um, you need to understand your insurer's process. So uh, it, it, really opens up the need for you to communicate with them. And I can't speak too highly of RAS in this area because you do need some independent outside advice. And I think RAS has shown over the past two and a half, nearly three years that they're fulfilling that function extremely well. And again, this is a question that has come up and has raised a few heckles over the recent weeks. Can I please uh, ask, you know, just implore you to again, please go back and have a look at the videos and see what uh, previous uh, insurers and lawyers have said on this topic. Uh, it's, it's very useful information. And I thank you for holding your frustrations. Right, we're just coming through. That's right. Uh, sir. Can the panel or Put us in, look, I'm, de I'm dealing with just rebuilds and repairs. So I'm looking at rebuilds and repairs. How, as you as master builders and builders out there, how do you assess on these cash settlements when they are based on generic information out of a guideline by the insurance companies that actually don't reflect, particularly in repairs and in rebuilds? In rebuilds, it doesn't reflect in the geotechnical information that the actual settlement is paid out on the geotechnical information, generic designs out of the guidelines, but does not match the elephant in the room being the actual site in the building. Worse in repaired homes, where the actual um, settlement, particularly you can see, and the insurance company, are actually based on generic, again, repairs that don't reflect. I'm thinking of rubble foundations, I'm thinking of uh, river tailings under slabs. Now, those settlement cases are going out how to use a private industry, fix those houses 
when they are on a in-house price system and based on a generic repair that there's nothing in relation to the actual house. These people are cash settled. Where do they go from there? Okay, well, um, firstly, um, separate new build from repairs because they're two total um, kettles of fish. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Well, I would say there's, there's, there's more certainty to be able to price like for like home um, as a rebuild. Um, the, the key comes down to it. We're, me personally, obviously, I own my own construction company. Um, we would submit our findings on what we believe it would cost us to replace the home. We don't listen to the insurer's figure and nine times out of ten they end up agreeing with a little bit of argy-bargy in between close to our figure. Okay, So I wouldn't cash settle unless you've had independent advice on what. Oh absolutely. Yeah, well, you wouldn't want to cash out without having some independent advice on what the cost of that building is. Um, it can be that way, but there's also quantity surveyors that are available. There's lots of means to obtain an independent assessment on the value of your home. So builders can do it, um, but also quantity surveyors is a good route to go down with. Um, when it comes to repairs, the scope is the most important thing to understand and get that right. And um, but again, um, you've got to walk through. I wouldn't rely on an insurance company's scope. I'd want to go through and rescope it ourselves and get possibly independent uh, experts, structural engineers, geotech engineers, to give advice before committing to a, a cash out or pricing it uh, for that, and also allowing a huge contingency for unknowns. Don't be afraid to use a building company as uh, your QS and to give you a quote. We get people coming in all the time asking questions about what the foundations are going to be when they can provide a geotech report or how much it might cost. That is one of the services that a group builder can do. We are doing it. We have got experience probably in the street or nearby the street where, where you're looking at. So we, our information will be up to date it will be based on experience and we are very, very cautious about people that talk about cash settling before they've had a really good quote from the building company because we're not adverse to having a few punch-ups with the insurance companies either. All right, again a big question, I'll just pass it over to John too. You know, people are getting stuck in this space, John. Knowing whether or not a cash settlement is enough to rebuild a house or to do repairs is always a really curly question and um, I would encourage everyone to go and see, engage their own experts but sometimes there is a cost with that. Um, sometimes with some insurers you can get them to agree to meet that cost in advance and that can be a good way to get around it. At RAS we also have a technical panel and on our technical panel is a firm of quantity surveyors, Rawlinson's, and they can peer review costings, and that is a free service, so that's another option at your disposal. Yeah, I, I, this is a, a, a difficult area, and with insurers upping the ante on um, cash settlements um, at the moment, there are a lot of questions and a lot of issues around this, and uh, I think insurers are sensitive to it, and they, um, they're uh, moving forward as as much as they can and trying to understand the individual customer's point of view. So I, you, need, you need to communicate, communicate as clearly as possible with them. And look, I, I've, I've built my own homes, I've ripped homes up, ripped them out, and I, I'm an accountant. And you know, I've, sometimes you, you sit there amongst the rubble and the ruin and you, you, you just don't know where to go. So you know, even when you've had the experience and you know how to um, project manage your own things, you, um, you can get faced with situations where you just don't know which way to go and, and you end up with mind block. So to fully understand your cash settlement, I think you need to take your, um, your, your uh, settlement information from your insurer, which will include your uh, cost of scope of works, and, and then discuss it with your own advisors, uh, builder, get some quotes, um, and then if necessary, 
go to the RAS and get that independent comparison um, with, um, with their experts in there. Thanks for that question. Hopefully we've got a few pieces there for you. Sir. Um, we were um, going to be a repair and the insurance company gave us the name of a builder. So this is Alistair, I want your help here. Um, we had never heard of the builder before and we worked with them for 11 months until they decided it was uneconomical to repair. We've now been with them eight months while they're deciding what it's going to cost to replace our house. And yesterday we got a phone call and on Saturday we'll be presented by the insurance company with um, um, a payout option. But we, we don't know this builder and you talked about doing the research and finding out uh, if they're reliable and with the number that are collapsing, how actually does a person like us find out whether that builder is on solid ground if we're going to start handing over hundreds of thousands of dollars? Okay, so there was a couple of questions uh, in there. Um, so I'll deal with the first one first, um, which is how do you know um, or get information about the builder? If it, firstly, I'd, I'd go and say is that if you're cash settling, you're free to choose who you want to build with. But that's your first question is, is it going to be the right value? Um, do you research? How do you find out? You know, you, you, can, you can only dig around, you can ask people. Christchurch is a small uh, community, so there's a lot of people know a lot of, a lot of things there and there. It won't take long to find actually out about your builder. Um, you know, um, you, you're entitled to ask for some financial statements. You know, that's quite common to be asked for. How, how are you tracking financially? Um, you know, ask for some reference from them. Um, you know, to go and speak to people who have built with them. You know, knock on their door. That's a good way of finding out, you know. Um, again, you, you, as master builders, we, we understand their business. Um, generally, if, if someone comes to master builders, they haven't, haven't um, traded for more than three years, they don't become a member. That's, that's how we see. We need to see track record and history behind them. So someone that's come new to the market, they could be very good. Um, and, you know, a lot of people got to start somewhere. So you, you, you might be finding you're on a real winner, but you need to know their background. You need to know who they are, what sort of money they've got behind them, you know, um, how they run their operation. So you just got to dig, dig around and have a look. Cash settling, um, if you're cash settling and you're relying on the uh, builder's uh, price that the insurance company has engaged to come up with the value. Again, we've repeated the same thing, get an independent advice from an independent building company or an, a quantity surveyor or another builder to cross-check it. Because your house is likely to be your most valuable asset, the thing that I say to my clients is make sure that you do your due diligence one of the things that you can do with building companies is go on to the company's office website and do a search either under the name of a company or else um, under the name of directors. And if a director has been involved in a number of companies that have gone bust, then that might be telling you that there's a risk in going with that company. So there is a lot of information out there in the public domain and the starting point is just accessing that information so that you can make informed decisions about who you go with. All right, thank you. We're in, we're in the front row. Ma'am. Um, just a, qu a question to the insurance guy. Um, we're a rebuild and it's a like-for-like -like policy. Now, I understand the same footprint, the same square metres, etc. Does the aesthetic look of the house be considered a like for like? If you've got weatherboard, uh, they'll put weatherboard back. If you've got brick, they'll, they'll put brick back in the main, if, if they can get it. Um, if you've got some obscure... Um, stuff they may buy, they can't find, they will look for the closest option. Um, you know, maybe some, uh, an, old, an old brick or something like that which is not available. But they will, 
in the main, put back what they can put back. So it will be like for like, but uh, within within reason. They won't. Um, um, the, the, you won't get elaborate um, uh, exterior cladding, for example, or uh, that that sort of thing, uh, in place of standard um, slate Durex siding. So it will be like for like. So if you've had an, uh, if you've got a, an issue around that or a problem, and you want to have a chat to me, we can uh, talk about the specifics of it afterwards. Well, like for like, except if it's TC3 land, of course, because then you can't go more than 30 kilograms a square metre. So if it is brick on TC3 land, it won't be brick again. But there are products that can be made to look attractive, and as part of your rebuild, you will be wanting to talk to your whoever you engaged to make it look attractive. And there might be other ways of making it look attractive for you. There's often no extra cost in that. It's in the design, it's in the ideas. So don't be afraid to push that for getting it nice. But often you are will be limited in the cladding that you can use. There are advantages in the rebuild from a Building Act point of view because you have to come to current compliance, which means that some of the things that you dreamed of having in your house, you may well be able to get as part of this, for example, double glazing. So you can't argue the like for like down to the very last point because there are some areas where there are concessions being made the other way. And so you need to come to an agreement with your insurer um, to get what you want as near as possible with the insurance that's available. <laughs>